Okay, welcome everybody to the webinar on biogas RNG project delivery. Thanks for joining us. It's a very exciting time to be in this biogas RNG space. So much going on. And so wanted to present this learning opportunity to the marketplace to talk about uh, delivering projects. And I've got a wonderful team here with us today. Going to be uh, joining the presentation, John Deneen from Mead and Hunt, Scott Martin with Burns and McDonald, Pete Thompson with Noresco. And so um, this webinar is being recorded. And so by tomorrow, it'll be up on biogas.tv. So Biogas TV is a free resource that I sponsor for educational purposes for the biogas industry. So check it out and I welcome your input. Um, the slides for these presentations are going up today on my website, green-tech forward slash events. So you can Google Green Tech and you'll find your way to these slides uploaded on my website. So with that, I'll get us kicked off here. So a quick intro to, uh, to Green Tech. So I provide RNG project advisory services, chemical engineer by background. I've been doing biogas projects either as an engineer, EPC or developer for about 20 years. Also represents some leading edge equipment lines in the biogas RNG space spending a lot of time doing projects like this, education and, and webinars. Got some cool resources up on my website, greentech.com. Uh, one thing up there that's uh, kind of fun is an industry directory. So, so check that out, as well as uh, Biogas TV for uh, educational programs. So we're trying to do these webinars on a monthly basis. Um, we recently had one on technology that is uh, posted on the website. Next one is September 7th. It's gonna focus a lot on the ITC and domestic content. We're gonna hear from uh, several companies that do construction and fabrication of, of components in this biogas space. So much pressure now to uh, look at domestic content. So um, stay tuned for that on September 7th. So today we're gonna to talk a lot about project delivery, EPC contracting. And so I'm just gonna kind of scratch the surface with introducing this idea. And so quite an, on a quite simple basis, a goal of EPC contracting is as you're working on a project, you work with your EPC contractor and you say, I've got all of this, whatever this is, right? So take a look at this kind of elevation view of a biogas plant. You see all the digesters down here is the gas upgrading equipment. Here's a, a digest eight storage barn. Here's a utility building where you'd have things like uh, boilers. And so if I were to say everything inside this blue square, I'd work with my EPC contractor and say, this is all yours, all the equipment, all the piping, all the electrical, all the rigging, the structural, I would like you to take on process performance risk. I'd like you to take on schedule risk. I'd like you to commission this in, in conjunction with your partners all within a given boundary. So that's clearly a tall ask, a big lift. Understanding where all the pipe runs are, understanding the cost of all that equipment, estimating the number of hours to install all of that. That's a multi-month journey to get people comfortable to say, you know, me as the EPC, I'm good, I've got this. So just some thoughts here on the reality of the market these days is EPC project delivery companies are busy. So the market is, let's call it booming. So to get in the attention of EPC firm, you really need to be an educated buyer. So 
just making a phone call and saying, hey, can you help me build this biogas plant? Doesn't get you very far. Just really understanding what it is that you want to buy, understanding your feedstocks, understanding your offtakes, understanding your capacity, thinking through what partners that you're thinking about working with. So that's good on one hand to come to the project as an educated buyer, but also the EPC needs to have the flexibility to modify the approach because they're really the experts here in building these systems. If you're gonna look to them to provide a process guarantee to your project, you can't jam them with like, hey, you've got to build this and you've got to guarantee this. Their process people are going to say, well, is our, our expectations aligned here or maybe we're off? And also be reasonable in your schedule for proposals and their deliverables. So don't ask for things overnight. Give people ample time to provide their qualifications packages, price proposals or an, an estimate for engineering services. So just uh, thought I'd throw a cool project I'm working out here. So I've developed some 3D project visualization tools. So I've been working through some 3D modeling programs where I've got some digesters pre-drawn, I've got POC upgraders pre-drawn, carbon beds, amine systems, membrane systems, and so at no cost, I'm able to do these for projects where we say, you know, maybe we're going to need 10 digesters. What's it going to be? So this is this drawing I can create in five minutes. So as you're trying to explain to your partners concepts rather than back of the napkin hand sketches, we've got some tools now that we can look at using to speak to partners, potential partners. So some goals for today. So listen for, you know, how does a project get to a final construction price? That's a, that's a very intricate journey. How does a buyer protect yourself to make sure, you know, everybody's risks are aligned, the reward to the EPC is fair, and try to make things feel like a real, a real partnership. Let's also think about a path forward. So as this industry is nascent, it's growing, terminology is very different from one company to the next. Other industries has arrived at some standards of how they roll, pick one. So let's say the refining industry, they've got some very disciplined processes, they have disciplined specifications, disciplined terminology. So I'm excited to hear from John, Scott, and Pete today about their companies and their journeys and how do they deliver projects. They'll have some variations on their own terminology, but so much of these journeys are the same of how do you get from concept design to a hard design and a, and a hard bid. So as I wrap up my intro here, allow me to riff a little bit on um, the hot topic this month is the ITC. Everybody just wants to talk about capitalizing on the IRA and getting the maximum ITC. And the real hot topic lately has been the bonus for domestic content. So to get your bonus for domestic content, you need three key features. You need your structural steel, you need all your concrete to be domestically sourced. But the real touchy one is this topic called manufactured products. And you need your manufacturer's products to meet a 40% threshold to qualify. So you need all those three to get to your 10%. On getting to the 40% minimum threshold, the reality I'm seeing lately is European components are lower cost than US components. So historically, we've imported so much from Europe. And now we're looking at goosing up the, the US domestic suppliers. But for starters, the US components seem to be more expensive. So I close this slide out with, you know what, it actually might not be worth the fight. It's a blessing we get 30% ITC through the 
prevailing wage and apprenticeship clauses. But I'm not saying for a second here that it's an automatic that you should say, oh, yeah, I have to have the 10% domestic content because it's actually a lot of work. And why do I say this? So in May, the IRS came out with this guidance document that are asking for some transparency in price breakouts that seem to be challenging. So they're at a very high level that show like component costs and even further breakouts within the components to direct parts and labor cost. So this document I've shown here, I'd encourage everybody to download it and, and read it. Um, there's a lot to there to help us get to this 10%. So here's an example that's in that document. The IRS says, okay, we're going to explain to you um, how this works. So we're gonna have this project called Project A. And so Project A has two products on it, product one and product two. So product one has two components. They're both US manufactured, so you're good there. But product two, has a foreign component to it. So what the IRS is saying is, we believe we're telling you to go to the provider of product two and get a breakout of the cost of component 2A, 2B, and 2C. We're going to give you credit based on components 2A and 2B, and oh, by the way, it's the direct costs on those, the parts and the labor. So I'm picturing many suppliers balking at this, refusing to provide the breakouts on this basis. So I smell conflict coming between developers, investors, and technology providers on this whole topic. And so again, I say, is, is this um, domestic content worth the fight? And so here's my friendly domestic equipment provider getting these requests, because as the IRS guidance tells you here, your total manufactured product costs, you add up the applicable component costs, and then as highlighted here, you're allowed to tell us only about your direct costs. Don't tell us about your, your overhead or your profit. And so, for example, if you're looking at a $200,000 US centrifuge for a project to dewater solids, you can't use that $200,000 price. The IRS is looking for that 100,000-ish of direct costs, right? You can, so, so these conversations with the supplier, like, okay, so tell me your labor and your materials, just again, fodder for conflict. If manufactured products requirements were only this easy. So what I've done here is come up with a, a hypothetical project, project X, and we're looking at the manufactured product content here. So I'm saying we're buying these digesters as non-domestic, the steel tanks as domestic, the boiler as domestic, the gas upgrader as domestic, compressor as domestic, and the others follow. So here we have 54% domestic content, we're good. So, so this exercise, I wish it were this simple where you can still buy an all European digester, right? You just have to balance that out with the domestic supply, like in this example. So we've, we've cleared the 40% hurdle with some room. So, Anyway, had to get that out there just because domestic content is is such a uh, a hot topic of late, and so really excited to to hear um, next from John Deneen. So I'll give me a second to give you um, control of the screen. All right, and people should be able to see what I've got on the screen right now. We got you, yeah. Okay, awesome. All right, thanks, Paul. Good uh, good introduction there in terms of the 
ITC especially. Um, I won't touch much on that, but what I am gonna focus on is the phased engineering approach uh, that our company does for RNG project delivery. So I'm John Deneen. I'm with Meet and Hunt. Uh, been here for a couple of years now. Uh, my role is business development. So uh, whenever we have a potential project developer, project owner who has a RNG project they want developed, um, I work through the stages of taking that concept uh, through preliminary engineering all the way through final construction um, uh, with our company acting as an engineer and then doing procurement and construction. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about our phased delivery approach to the upfront engineering side of this. Uh, the quick background on our company and who we are. So we are an employee owned engineering, procurement, construction and architecture firm. Uh, we have about 1200 employees nationwide spread across 40 offices. Uh, I'm a part of our EPC and renewable energy group. Uh, and some of you may have familiarity with our uh, EPC group as Symbiont, which we now go by Symbiont Meat and Hunt Company. Just over a year ago, uh, what we call the Legacy Symbiont Group uh, merged with Mead and Hunt. So I was part of our Legacy Group, um, and that Legacy Group acts as the EPC arm for the larger Mead and Hunt company. And then the other thing I'd mention, just in terms of background about us and who we are, um, we do have a fabrication shop. So we do skid mounted equipment um, that comes in pretty handy for a lot of RNG facilities. So here is kind of an overview of a start to finish project schedule. Um, the, the way I'm showing it here is a schedule driven project. So a lot of times when we get the call from a owner developer in the early stages, you know, one of the first questions they ask is, you know, well, two questions, how much will it cost and when will it be ready? Um, and so a lot of our projects are schedule driven. Getting to revenue is an important driver. So this is the way we tend to structure things for schedule driven projects. And like I mentioned, I'm gonna be focused on kind of the preliminary engineering side of this equation to show how we get to an EPC contract. And I'll return back to this slide a couple times throughout, but we'll kind of dive into what goes into each of these phases on the left here. Uh, so we call this uh, a progressive design. Uh, it breaks off the initial engineering stages into several bite-sized chunks. And the biggest goal of these chunks is to be able to first quickly deliver a relatively accurate budget, and then to go through some steps to progressively tighten that budget accuracy. Um, this is one other slide we'll kind of return back to several times throughout the presentation. So again, this is just showing uh, that timeline I just talked about, and we'll fill in each of these boxes as we go. So uh, talking about what we want to come out of each of these phases with, what are the key things we're looking to achieve in each phase? So the, the key outcomes on the conceptual design phase are that we want to have selected and identified the optimal unit processes uh, that meet the goals of the project. We wanna come out of this with a class four budget estimate. And that class four budget estimate is a total installed cost, including engineering, construction, procurement, um, all in. And the budget accuracy range that we're seeking at this stage is usually about a minus 15 to plus 25% accuracy. We wanna come out of this stage with a preliminary project schedule. And then our uh, project owner developer is typically gonna take uh, those last two pieces of information, the capital budget and the project schedule. And they're gonna put that into their financial pro forma and make sure that this project they've identified, uh, the business case is sound for it. So we'll uh, now go into some of the steps that we go through in that concept design phase. Uh, throughout all of these preliminary engineering steps, one thing we're focused on is risk minimization, and that goes both directions. So I'm gonna talk about risk minimization in terms of what we achieve for the developer uh, primarily, 
But when we minimize risk for the developer, uh, in large part, what we're doing is also minimizing that risk on our side as well. So early on, we want to identify any potential red flags or fatal flaws that could ultimately derail the project. If there are any of those issues and we spot them early, it may be possible to engineer around those issues. Or in some cases, uh, potentially the, the perfect project the developer had turned out to have one issue that's uh, not so easily overcome and, and will never be overcome. So in our concept design stage, we, we want to identify that right away. Uh, one thing that project developers like uh, about this uh, phased approach, again, is that it does minimize the upfront capital commitment. When they're going through this initial concept design, if we catch uh, you know, a fatal flaw issue that would derail the eventual project early, they're not committed for nearly as much capital as if they've taken on a, a larger engineering commitment. And the other thing we wanna do in this uh, stage is make sure everyone's clear on what their roles and responsibilities are. Um, put a box around what the EPC is responsible for, what the project owner is responsible for, and make sure that all those roles and responsibilities are clearly delineated. Typically in the concept of design phase, um, people may actually split that up into two sections as well. Uh, one being the feasibility, which would come before concept design. Some project owner developers are uh, pretty capable of executing a feasibility level analysis on their own. So sometimes we get brought in after feasibility has already been done by the owner developer. Uh, some are, are not capable or um, don't have the experience to be able to go through feasibility on their own. In those cases, we do that as a standalone uh, scope of work, um, or, we could eventually, or we could possibly review the feasibility work that an owner has done prior to our involvement. Some typical things that we like to uh, offer as deliverables for a feasibility scope of work are substrate analysis, look at what's being digested, um, put together an initial basis of design that will be carried forward in through subsequent phases. Um, we look at the major inputs in terms of substrate and then identify the major outputs, uh, RNG, solids, wastewater, those types of things. Um, at this stage, we're generally starting to take our first pass at selecting the major unit processes. Um, and then putting together a block flow diagram based on what those processes are. Uh, we'll typically put together a rough order of magnitude budget. Um, and generally in the feasibility stage, this is pretty low level of total design. We're thinking maybe like 5%. Um, but following the feasibility, we get into what we'd call the concept design phase. Again, this is a standalone scope of work. Uh, and these are some of the deliverables that we like to come out of this concept design phase with. So we have formalized the basis of design at the end of this. We've started sizing major equipment as well as started getting as well as getting budgetary quotes for the major equipment. We've put together a preliminary mass and energy balance. Our block flows now moved on to a more detailed process flow diagram. And we're starting to put a general arrangement together uh, to show the layout of equipment. Uh, again, that responsibility matrix I mentioned earlier and the class four budget uh, and schedule that I had mentioned earlier. And at this point, we're maybe at around like 10 to 15% design level. One of the things that we like in terms of the way we're set up as an EPC is our technology agnostic approach, which enables collaboration with a wide variety of uh, technology vendors. So that technology approach, agnostic approach is uh, first helpful when we're selecting our technology types. I'll use a gas upgrader as an example here because it is one of the uh, biggest capital investments in terms of major equipment. But so on a typical RNG project, um, you know, it may be entirely applicable to look at membrane separation, pressure swing absorption separation, aiming, possibly water wash. Um, so we're able to take a clear eyed look at the potential technology types and able to identify which one makes the most sense for the project. Then once the technology type has been identified, uh, we don't have uh, specific relationships with any uh, 
technology vendors. So we're able to play the field and uh, find the right technology vendor for the team. A lot of those uh, technology types that I mentioned will have multiple reputable vendors. And then it's about uh, evaluating them uh, based on criteria that's important to both the EPC and the project developer. A couple of those uh, criteria might include performance. So we generally would be telling a technology vendor, like say on the gas upgrader, we're guaranteeing X volume of biogas with X quality characteristics into the system. And then they tell us what their guarantee is for Y in terms of finished uh, product gas out. Um, so that, that performance guarantee is an important one. Uh, schedule is another really important one when it comes to uh, vendor selection. Uh, delivery timeline for a lot of the gas upgrading equipment right now may be at a year. Um, some might, might be a little lower, some a little higher, but that can have a pretty big impact on project timeline and, and set the critical path for the ultimate uh, project delivery. Uh, related to schedule, if we know that our EPC contract that we're discussing with the owner um, is going to have uh, schedule performance uh, liquidated damages, then we need buy-in from our vendors on that as well. So that's something we're starting to discuss with them at this stage as well. On the flip side, if our contract is going to have liquidated damages, we're generally seeking incentives for early completion. And that <clears throat> that's a conversation we might be uh, having with the technology vendors as well. Here's just a snippet of a responsibility matrix that we would develop at this stage. Um, doesn't show all the lines. It just uh, is on here to give you a flavor for kind of the level of detail and the way we structure this. You can see that there's a column for the owner, column for meet and hunt. Uh, there may be a column for vendors. There may be a column for subs who are, say, responsible for geotechnical investigation or site survey. Um, this streamlines collaboration. Ultimately, having all these responsibilities outlined saves time, and then it also provides a, a high level of transparency. Here's a snippet of a class four cost estimate. Um, I'm only showing a section of it here. And what I wanted to communicate is the level of detail you could expect to see with a class four estimate. Uh, we break it down into several buckets we call fa budget phases. And on this one, I think I have six or seven of those uh, buckets for you to see. So this is the level of breakdown and detail you can expect. Um, you know, it's in including detailed design, project management as one phase, major equipment as a phase, minor equipment. Um, so that's kind of what to expect with uh, class four budget estimate. So now we're going to move on. We'll say that uh, the concept design has cleared the hurdles uh, that the project owner developer was needing to clear, and they've made their business case. Uh, they're ready to move on to the next scope of work. We generally go to uh, what we call a preliminary design uh, to a guaranteed maximum price. So what we're wanting to come out of this phase with is uh, that guaranteed maximum price budget. Typically, we are driving the budget accuracy down to about 5% contingency on our side at this point. Uh, we're putting together a much more detailed schedule. And in some cases, <clears throat> excuse me, in some cases for a schedule-driven project, we're getting limited notice to proceed on shop drawings for some of the long lead major equipment items. The biggest thing that both sides want to come out of this phase with is an EPC contract that will carry us into final design and implementation. So now we'll look at a few of the things that go into this preliminary design phase to get to that EPC contract. Again, we're focused on risk minimization. Uh, by this stage, we are focused on minimizing the budget risk, the quality risk, and the schedule. Um, so that budget, uh, we're going to be getting bids from subs that are required for us to get to a level of budget accuracy needed to offer that guaranteed maximum price. Uh, the quality we're going to address by having uh, periodic and set design reviews uh, between, well, both internally and with the client and their owner's engineer, if applicable. And then as we're getting much more detailed with the schedule, we're giving the client a much better idea 
of exactly when they could start counting revenue on their financial model. Here's an example of one of those, those subcontractor bid sets. So as we're doing our more uh, detailed preliminary engineering, uh, we're putting together bid sets to get uh, bids from subcontractors. And this is just an example of, of a piping list for a mechanical subcontractor. Uh, we're releasing these bid sets to subs as they become ready. Um, and then uh, working with uh, our estimating team, which is in-house to get that uh, GMP budget put together. Typical deliverables we would have at the preliminary design stage or the design to GMP stage. Um, we're doing, uh, again, mass and energy balance is getting more dialed in. At this point, we're doing uh, P and IDs. We're putting together equipment list. We're doing uh, preliminary structural and architectural as well as civil design. Uh, we're getting a more detailed site plan together, uh, mechanical and yard piping. We're putting together electrical diagrams as well as uh, controls work. Uh, as we get that design completed, uh, like I mentioned, what we're going for is a guaranteed maximum price. And that, that includes the cost to get to final design. So at this point, we haven't gotten to full issue for construction drawings. It's not a final design stage yet, but we've narrowed the contingency based on past experience to the level we can offer that. And then, uh, so that GMP will include costs for final design and actual installation of the facility. If that price meets the project owner developer's needs, then what we would start doing is putting together an EPC contract. Typically the EPC contract's going to include that price. It's going to include breakdown of what the, the price is based on. And then it's generally gonna uh, include a bunch of the deliverables that I mentioned up above as exhibits in that EPC contract. So moving along then, we've got to the point where we've uh, agreed on an EPC contract. Now it's time for final design. Um, coming out of the final design stage, we want the uh, all detailed drawings to be issued for construction level. Uh, we're hiring our subcontractors, finalizing the schedule with those subcontractors. Um, we're ordering any remaining long lead equipment that uh, wasn't ordered or at least given notice to proceed in the previous stage. And then uh, towards the end of the final design for a scheduled dr driven project, uh, we might be already going out on site and beginning earthwork, as well as having our fab shop uh, get going on skids. So I'm returning now to this uh, flexible project delivery timeline. Uh, again, this one is the schedule driven. So a couple of things I wanted to point out, if you look at the, the green line here, um, note the location of that. So again, those long lead equipment items, if we get limited notice to proceed, we can generally start getting going on shop drawings uh, during that design to EPC contract or before the EPC contract is in place. Uh, if you look at the bidding, I've got a, a tail on that line. So those bid sets that I mentioned, we're putting together in final design. We're releasing those as they're ready. Um, so we're getting uh, final bids on things uh, before you would technically say final design completion. Um, and then the tail on construction, uh, you see that overlapping slightly with final design. Uh, so that's us uh, probably going out to begin some earthwork. Uh, here's an example plan set that we would come up with during final design. Um, I'm just going to move right along. A uh, topic that was noted for, for this presentation was uh, notes on integrating European equipment into the U.S. market. There can be some challenges there, um, but if you know that those challenges exist and you're able to proactively uh, deal with them, it can help minimize the impact. And it comes down to things even as simple as like time zone differences with European counterparts. There is quite a bit of collaboration that needs to go on uh, with the technology vendor. Um, and those time zones can create some challenges or number of vacation days uh, that they might have in average European countries could be a challenge as well. Um, design standards, something you wanna communicate with clearly and upfront uh, with vendors about uh, especially around safety. Uh, NFPA is an engineering guideline that's common in the US around fire protection, 
OSHA standards might be uh, something that we have uh, typical here, but but may not be thought of the same or uh, utilized the same with European technology vendors. So having conversations about what the expectations are around those design standards early is very helpful and can avoid impacts on getting your facility permitted. Uh, Communicating your power feed needs, uh, being aware that uh, nominal sizes may be, may be different. So things like nozzles and flanges, the cost for adapters can add up pretty quickly. Um, so you're needing to account for that early on. And then shipping terms, it can be pretty expensive to have uh, items getting stuck at port. Uh, so what we typically do is delivery duty paid is what we request where the vendor um, pays insurance and customs. Um, so that, that wraps up final design. Now it's time for implementation. I'll go pretty quick through these since my focus was really on the first three, uh, of this, but so during implementation, we're doing the rest of mobilization. Uh, we're managing the project as the general contractor per the schedule and budget we've agreed to. Uh, a lot of times warranty on major equipment will start up during this implementation phase. Uh, we'll generally develop a startup plan, uh, and do IO checkouts with our uh, controls and automation team in the field. I mentioned our fab shop earlier. So our fabrication shop's located in Wisconsin. Uh, what we like about it is the ability to control lead time. Uh, generally, when we're in charge of the fabrication, we're able to get skidded equipment out to the field faster than, than we could otherwise if we were going to other fab shops or relying on vendors for certain things. And then there's a quality control element of it as well. Uh, we're able to put these things together in, in our quality controlled workshop. And then we assemble these things in a way that's fairly plug and play. So it can minimize the amount of construction time on site when you just drop the skids and connect them. Uh, as the project construction is uh, being finished, we hit close out. We're bringing vendors on site for commissioning. Those vendors are generally there for performance testing as well. This is a great time for operators, uh, whoever's gonna be operating the facility, whether the owner has their own operations team or third party, but to have them out there and begin training. Uh, we'll go through a punch list uh, with the client as well as uh, put together a preventative maintenance program for them. And looks, let's see, uh, oh yeah, one other thing before I'm out of time here. So I've talked about the way we progress through these things, but I haven't talked about the actual uh, durations yet. So I'm just going to give kind of an example of a dairy manure project that's going to have two 2.5 million gallon digesters. And what we would generally expect is the concept design might take around three months, including feasibility and concept. We might anticipate about another three months for design to the level required for an EPC contract. Once that EPC contract is in place, to get from final design through uh, startup, you might anticipate around another 14 months. So adding that all up, uh, you might be looking at around like anywhere from 18 to 24 months. Uh, I've got my info on the screen here. Uh, write down my email address, shoot me an email. Uh, if you've got questions related to this content, be happy to uh, follow up with anyone as needed. Great, John. Nice job. Thank you very much. Okay, so with that, going to hand off here to Scott Martin from Burns and McDonald. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Maybe it takes a second. Did you hit the share screen button? Oh, forgot to do that. Sorry. Bear with me here, sorry. Take your time. It it takes there's a lot of a lot of mouse clicks to do. There we go. Oh, perfect. Okay. All right. So I'm Scott Martin. I'm with Burns and Mac. I've been at Burns and Mac. It'll be 16 years in October. Uh prior to that, I worked for another firm for three years, uh, mechanical engineer by background. Uh been doing uh biogas projects my entire career. So I started uh, doing landfill gas collection systems, uh, got into landfill gas to electricity um, earlier in my career as well, which morphed into working on um, 
some some agricultural projects. Um, so mechanical background, have a lot of experience um, as in, in the design world, both for um, solid waste facilities and anaerobic digestion facilities. Uh, Burns and Mac, for those of you that don't know, is a 13,000 person employee owned firm. Uh, we have two direct hire construction companies within the Burns and McDonald umbrella. So one's union uh, out of Appleton, Wisconsin, and the other is non-union out of Texas. Um, we are, um, we're currently working on uh, all types of RNG projects. So I have a couple of wastewater projects, uh, two landfill projects going right now. Um, fair amount of agricultural digester projects and uh, a food waste project. So with that, I'll go ahead and get into it. Um, I'm planning on covering uh, really um, some of the front end planning aspects um, just from a professional services perspective. So there, there might be a little bit of redundancy between my presentation and John's, but I think the content's different enough. And then really wanna kind of get into the question about debunking some EPC myths because um, a lot of times people are hesitant to to want to go to EPC just because the, per, the perception is, is that the costs are going to be higher. So on the front end planning perspective, um, there are a number of things um, that enter into the discussion when, when we're looking at a, a FEP uh, process um, that can influence the outcome and, and as we all know rng projects have have a number of different um important items that need to be figured out fairly early in a project so not not going to dwell on this slide too much it's got a lot of words on it but i think in in general you know understanding um where where your big ticket items are for risk is is important and that's and that's vetted through our front end planning process. Um, some other other good benefits with the FEP process. Um, it speaks to improving constructability, um, early coordination with with an EPC contractor um, allows for uh, iterative discussions or, or with with construction resources allows for iterative discussions with the owner around uh, cost benefits of of certain items as as a as design progresses along. Um, it also transfers risk um, from the owner to the contractor uh, through getting more design certainty. Um, it enables improved quality and it also enables uh, improved safety through uh, influence of having a, a constructor on board. Uh, the two predominant um, terminologies that we use at Burns and Mac are CII and AACE. CII is more, um, I would say, in the, in the energy space or the oil and gas space. AACE is typically more um, typically more commonly used in the utility and developer space. So um, this is a, a simple graphic, or I should say, a very wordy graphic, but a breakdown of the FEP planning process as um, as illustrated by CII. Um, so essentially what we're looking at here is FEP1 is plus or minus 50% design. So where that, where that layers in is just a, a very, very cursory review to see if a project makes sense. Um, FEP2, you, pro you progress the design a bit more to about 10% engineering complete. And some disciplines during FEP2 actually progress a bit further than that, but overall it's about three to 10%. Um, and then your FEP3, um, you're, you're starting to develop more engineering to try to get that cost certainty. And I think, um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's different gates in terms of how you're estimating during each process. So that's illustrated here. Um, and I think um, this might be a helpful tool for, for all of those listening in uh, moving forward, just in terms of understanding the overall process. Um, AACE has a similar process um, in terms of what I'll call gates. Uh, class five is pretty akin to an FEP, um, FEP one level of effort. Uh, class four um, is, is more your feasibility stage. So that's usually at your class four level, that's, you know, um, you're getting in and doing about 10% engineering. 
to figure out or 10% overall uh, effort to figure out whether or not uh, your project looks feasible. And then typically your, your class three estimate is where you have your uh, capital decision made. So you, that's, that's essentially you know, where, where you're looking. And you'll notice here in terms of some of the contingency ranges in AAC versus CII, they're a little bit different. Um, so that's just maybe something to think about when, when you're walking through a project with a specific client. So this is kind of an, this is an overlay of, of essentially the two. So your class five is, is akin to an FEL one, as I mentioned earlier. Class four is akin to an FEL two. Class three is similar to an FEL three, and then you're in uh, detailed design from, from there on. Um, so one of the things that I think is is good um, in terms of this process is you're you're able to to develop costs and refine those costs without having to um, you know commit full capital to a project. So essentially what that means for a lot of our clients that we take along through this process is uh, there's discussions around how much contingency should we hold? Where, where's the risk? You know, those sorts of things that, that enter in during the feasibility and concept stage um, level that kind of enable an overall good experience for everybody involved and a holistic view of where the project needs to go. So some key variables in, in the early phase of engineering testing, um, documentation is key. So um, as, as you're moving through, sometimes we'll pick up a project that's FE2, FEP3 stage. So having the documentation that was prepared prior is, is very important. Um, pricing, um, to John's point earlier, going out and getting, getting budget pricing on all major equipment, uh, including process equipment, electrical and instrumentation is important. Um, one thing that, that is also very important is understanding what are the costs outside of all the major equipment. So outside the battery limits, um, developing proper endos uh, and defining those. Um, depending on where the project is uh, or if you're in two different projects, the labor rates may be drastically different. So for example, um, in the Southeast, labor rates are tr traditionally cheaper than in the upper middle. So project that you build in South Carolina might, might be a little bit different than a project that you build in Wisconsin. Uh, freight and taxes, um, very important to include often forgotten about, but those are real project costs. Um, Indirect costs are also important. So understanding early on where what we think indirects are going to be. And then usually the cost for a friend design engineering is, is estimated uh, based upon a, a developed staffing plan. Contingency um, typically is a, an open discussion in terms of as the project progresses, identifying risk and assigning contingency to that risk is, is pretty important. Um, and then obviously we've been dealing with escalation here for, for a bit, so not, not insignificant. And a lot, of, a lot of our clients, especially uh, utility clients, will owners costs that are included in a given project when, when they go to, to get a project approved by their board. So this is a essentially a vice versa for registers. Very good craft availability, geotech. Your your bandwidth is low. Maybe you can turn your video off. You're coming up okay. yep, choppy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, so, so this is a, an example. So this is typically done at our at our FEP three stage. Any better, Paul? You you're you're breaking up. Okay. Yeah, if you're speaking, I can't hear you. Okay, hear me now. 
Yes, I'm hearing you now. Yes. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so uh, don't yeah, really put it out there, but actually, uh, at the at the FEP three stage is is typically or class three estimating stage is typically where we'll define this formal risk register, um, and and it's something that we start early on in the process, but really this is something that we use to inform contingency uh, before we move into project. For uh, what the impacts that cost, uh, the owners for and standards can. All right, we uh, we've lost Scott. So I'm sure we'll hear back from him, but uh, Pete, if you're ready, why don't you jump in the pool here? Sure. Well, yeah, sure. Why not? I can I can do that. Just give me uh, permission and I'll share. OK, here you go. Um, let's go there. Go there. Get rid of that. All right. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Excellent. Hopefully my my sound quality will be better. I'm on a hotel Wi-Fi myself. So you're, fingers you're, crossed. You're coming in loud, loud and clear. All right. I'll I'll shout louder if need to, if need be. Um, I'm Pete Thompson. I uh, am with Noresco and I lead Noresco's water and wastewater um, business line. Um, we work primarily in my space in the water and wastewater space, we work primarily with municipal clients but we have and can work for, for a variety of clients. Um, Noresco is an energy services company. And in that, um, in that functionality, our business is developing and design building capital upgrades that enhance efficiency, reduce operating costs, or provide new revenue. Um, and we do this in my group throughout the water and wastewater industry space. Um, including um, biogas as well. Um, I am uh, a chemical engineer as well, Paul. Um, we have to stick together. Um, and I've been in the uh, water wastewater industry far longer than I care to admit, something over 30 years. Um, so, you know, the way the way I'm I'm watching this this webinar roll out, um, John started talking about pure progressive design build. Um, he didn't use those terms, but that's that's the term I, I tend to use and is and is used by a DBIA. And I'll talk more about this in a, in a moment. Um, and then um, Scott was talking about the professional services side of progressive design build. I'm moving more toward a, a firm fixed price hard bid design build, which is the, the traditional definition of EPC. Um, I'm going to start here with a, with a bit of a shameless plug. Um, DBIA is the Design Build Institute, Design Build Institute of America. I would type Council. Life goes on, um, and then there's also the Water Water Collaborative Delivery Association. They have each created a set of guidance manuals, best practice manuals, case studies, um, contracting documents, etc. I find them very useful um, in, you know, first discussing the differences between the delivery methods as well as the best practices. And I'm drawing from these, these documents throughout as well as from my experience. I've been doing design build for at least, geez, 20 years. So um, I... I believe, uh, I'm sorry. So I encourage you to do that. All of their documents are available. If you're not a member of either association, they're, they're available at a cost. And oh, by the way, continuing the shameless plug, DBIA does offer certification, um, which uh, um, I, I have. I don't know if, if Paul listed my full alphabet soup at the end of the, in the inv invitation or not. So, uh, definition of EPC, not going to read it all. The key point here is 
that the EPC contractor is responsible to, for delivering a complete facility, guaranteed price by a fixed date, and it must perform to the specified level. So going back to Paul's presentation, I think it was his first or second slide where he had the uh, digesters and the gas cleaning and the digest eight storage and a box around it. For all intents and purposes, EPC contractor is responsible for everything inside that box. Um, the difference between what John and Scott were talking about and what I'm talking about is in the progressive approach, there's a lot of design done up front. The, the design builder um, does design, works closely with the owner, develops the design to some percentage at which a firm fixed price or a guaranteed maximum price is established. In the hard bid design build world, what I'm talking about, that design doesn't happen on the owner's side and in the beginning, it goes very quickly to a hard bid. And I'll discuss that process here in a moment. So and I'll discuss that process on this slide. <laughs> so the first thing that any owner should do is consider whether or not they need help. Um, and a help in this space would be an owner's advisor. It can be an engineer. It can be an attorney, depending upon the complexity and size. You may want both. I would um, suggest Paul can serve in this role very nicely. This person's job is to help you help the owner work through the process. Um, and the first thing that needs to happen is decide what delivery method is needed. Each of these delivery methods have advantages, they have disadvantages. And I'm, I'm including, by the way, design, bid, build, um, construction management at risk, progressive design, build, and hard bid design, build. And there's probably four or five other variations that you can do. They've each got advantages, they've each got disadvantages. And what you want to do is find the process that works for you. Now, I'm going to be talking about when, in a little bit, when um, straight EPC hard bid work makes most sense. But let's just assume for this time, for this period, that we selected hard bid, design, build, the owner advisor and the, and the owner have done that. The next thing that needs to be done is developing bridging documents. And you can think of bridging documents as specs, their requirements. It's what do you want? Um, it can include as little as this is your input, this is your output, go. And it can get as complex as you shall use these pieces of equipment, these, this, these materials of construction, et cetera. Um, what I would, echoing what, what Paul said at the very beginning, one of the huge advantages of this is the EPC contractors can provide um, optimal projects and, and optimal um, designs. So the less definition you put in here, the, the better value you are likely to get. However, the flip side of that is um, the less definition you give, the more variability in what you get. So if you know that you have this quantity of biogas or this quantity of, of digester feed, and you want renewable natural gas of this quality to meet the, your off-taker's requirements, and you don't really care what happens in between, the, the hard bid design build is a beautiful method. Um, now, the other part is, you can specify certain things. You can specify stainless steel pipe. You can specify certain valve requirements. You can specify certain PLCs, um, con you know, connectivity to a SCADA system, things like that. The things that are truly important to you. I would say that if you want to specify down to the equipment, this isn't the right delivery method for you. You're better off in a progressive design build. You'll, get, you'll be happier with the result. So once you have these bridging documents, you advertise, the, the best practice is to do a two-step um, procurement. The first step would be qualifications. You advertise generally 
You're looking for teams to submit who they are, what their experience is, what their team looks like, what their technology approach would look like, um, and how they would work with you. And the key here is you want to pick two to three you want to work with, you'd, in, you'd like to work with. This is really, truly a qualifications phase. It's you're picking the team that you're going to be working with for the next two to three years, and maybe longer depending upon the contract that you issue. Once you've down selected to those two or three, and it's it's very important that you limit the number of the number that you do here, because in the next step, the bidders put together a partial design. Much of the design that has been talked about in the last two um, presentations gets done by the bidders. They'll do a, a site layout, they'll do a flow sheet, they'll do P and IDs, they'll pick equipment, they'll, they'll get enough design done to allow them to, to set a firm fixed price. And that can be very expensive for contractors. Um, I have, I have you know, spent upwards of a million dollars putting together those, those bids. Um, so you don't want to exercise people you don't, aren't gonna wanna work with. You wanna limit the number of contractors that you go to, um, recognizing that they're going to spend a lot of money, a lot of time, and a lot of effort, and you know, it's really not fair. Some owners consider a stipend um, for the non-successful bidders at this phase. It's typically a fairly nominal amount of money, $100,000 or $200,000. It's intended to... Um, it's intended to offset some of the costs and make it a little more palatable to uh, to be at risk in in this scenario, you know, in a one of three scenario. Um, it also has a very interesting aspect to it that a lot of owners seem to use, in that the way they construct um, set up the documents, if the uh, design builder accepts the stipend, the owner may or may may own the work product that the design builder produced. Um, so the result of that is an intellectual property question. Um, a number of design builders I've known and worked with um, turn down the stipend when they're not selected in order to keep their intellectual property. So then the next step in this process is you pick your EPC. I would suggest you not pick low price. I would suggest you pick the best value the lowest price with the best team and the best approach to the project. Schedule is also a very key piece here, um, as well as things like uh, compliance with the IRA provisions. You know, do you have American products? Do, are you getting um, uh, Davis-Bacon wages? Are you getting apprenticeships, et cetera? I'm gonna talk more about that later. So once you've selected your EPC, you cut a contract, it's a firm fixed price contract, and the design builder goes through, they do the final engineering, they do the permitting, they do the procurement, and they build it. This is generally not a very collaborative process. There are usually um, submittals in the process, um, but owners who have a tendency or a desire, and this happens very often in the municipal space, to make a lot of comments on those, sorry about that, make a lot of comments on those submittals, um, this may not be the right, right process for you because the design builder has a scope of work and has a set of contract documents that, that, that define what they have and they're not going to want to change that if it costs more money. And if the owner changes it, makes changes, that's an opportunity for a change order from the design builder. So again, going all the way back to the far left on, on selecting your delivery method, you have to make sure that this method works for you before you go forward with it. So let's talk a little bit about advantages and disadvantages. Um, advantages to the process, speed. Um, you go very quickly to a firm fixed price or guaranteed max early. That's the second bullet. 
you're not spending a lot of time in the preliminaries, a lot of time in the in the uh, design phase up front. Um, you're going straight into it. The design builder only has to generate the, the drawings that are necessary for permitting and construction. So it can be a very a truncated process compared to others. Isn't always, but it can be. You get competitive bidding up front on everything. In a progressive design build, there is usually or often competitive bidding, but not always on everything, including the design builder's costs there. Um, risk transfer. You can, and this was mentioned earlier, I think in Scott's slides uh, uh, conversation, you can transfer risk, all of the risk to the contractor if you want. Um, what I would suggest though, um, is use of something like a risk register that Scott was talking about a couple of slides before he started breaking up and talk about where, with your owner's advisor and internally, where the risks best lie. For example, you can transfer escalation risk to the EPC contract, and that's, that's fine. You can do it, but you're going to pay for all of that risk, let's say the EPC contractor thinks that it's going to be 10% escalation over the period of time between the bid and, and the execution, they'll put 10% increase in there. And if it's only 3%, they pocket the difference. If, you know, so, so what you want, where you want to be as an owner here is you want to hold the risks that you can control or you can manage and transfer the risks that the EPC contractor can control and manage. So things that the EPC contractor should take, design risk, construction risk, performance risk, um, schedule risk, things like that. Um, the owner may be better placed to handle escalation risk. Oh, the, the design builder should have permitting risk too. The owner may be in a better place to have escalation risk, off uh, maybe the offtake interconnection risk because that can often be a very difficult situation, um, as well as input parameter risk. Um, if you put out a, a um, an RFP saying that the input uh, the gas production input to the cleaning system could vary from 100 cfm to 600 cfm and 350 to 850 BTUs per cubic foot you have transferred risk to the contractor that you are going to pay for. You will be paying for the worst case scenario there. The other advantage here is reduced change orders. In this space, the contractor owns all the change orders except differing site conditions, dig a hole, find something there that, what, that wasn't supposed to be there and no one knew was there, or changes by the owner. So if the owner comes in and says, hey, we've changed our standard PLC from Allen Bradley to Siemens. That's an opportunity for the design builder to say, okay, we can make that change. It will cost you X dollars more. But the change orders that often get, that get um, handled during design bid build style projects, design errors, um, you know, uh, poorly uh, laid out plans, things that are not constructible, those exist within the design builder. Disadvantages, and I'm going to come clean here, this is not my favorite delivery method. I prefer a progressive design build method. It does have application, and that's the bottom line on the bottom of the slide, but I personally think that the disadvantages are greater than the advantages. The first is limited collaboration. For all intents and purposes in this, your bridging documents and your contract are your only input into what you're getting. Um, you're really transferring the design responsibility and ability to the design builder. As a result, it can be confrontational. If the owner feels like the design builder is cutting corners, um, putting in lower quality products or, you know, taking risks that don't seem appropriate. Uh, they really don't have much to say about it um, in the contractual basis. So you can get into some pretty good arguments. 
The other piece is it may limit potential bidders, as I said earlier. It uh, costs a lot of money to put together these bids, and not everyone is is willing to do it, um, and not, they're not willing to do it on every project. And then finally, as I was talking, I've been talking about changes following bidding come at very high cost. So you know, weigh the advantages, weigh the disadvantages, and the bottom line here: this is the best delivery method when low cost is the main driver and you want a guaranteed delivery of a functioning facility. Hmm, that, length, that sentence doesn't make sense. Oh, well, it's when you when low cost is the main driver, you don't care much what you get in a product and you, and you're, and you want guaranteed delivery and guaranteed performance. That's when you should use this method. So some best practices, this is in general. Pick the best method for you. I've harped on that quite a bit. Um, now, uh, risk transfer costs money. Same thing I was talking about later, transfer the right risks. And by the way, these are mostly taken for the Design Build Institute of America best practices manuals. In general, more collaborative is better. Um, never select solely on price. Um, you're you're partnering with somebody you're going to be working with for many years and spending a lot of money with. You really want to work with people you can trust and you want to work with. Um, you need to understand that follow, going to a pure design, bid, design build, hard bid design build, you are giving the contractor control of the design. You have given up design control at that point. You can influence it, but you can't control it. Um, contracts. Fair contracts are always better. Um, it's very tempting as an owner to um, write a contract that's very much in your favor. And it's very tempting as a design builder to write a contract that's very much in your favor. The right way to do it, the best practice is to use a fair contract. I am a big proponent of the DBIA documents. There are other documents out there that are, that are perfectly good and very fair. I just like DBIA because they're designed for de design build documents. The other advantages of them is, is most EPC contractors have worked under them or are working under them. And they've been you know, litigated and developed by a broad range of part practitioners. So a moment about contingency. There's two buckets of contingency that should exist on every project. The first is the contractor's contingency, and the second is the owner's contingency. And they're very different, and they're there for very different reasons. Um, the contractor's contingency exists to cover things that were missed in an estimate, things that design issues that have not been developed fully yet, um, errors, frankly, construction errors are part of the contingency. The most important thing here is the, con the contingency in the contractor's budget is the contractor's contingency. It belongs to the contractor and it's expected and intended to be spent. It is not a bucket of money that will ultimately end up in the design builder's profit line. Some may, but the, the more normal practice is that money gets spent. A lot of owners will look at the contingency line and assume that that's money they will get back. That is just padding into the, into the um, estimate. It's not, it's money that will be spent. It's also not to be spent for owner changes. If an owner makes a change, the owner in a best practice is paying for that change. They are not expecting the contractor's contingency to cover that change. Therefore, the owner needs a contingency bucket to cover their changes, their adjustments, and any unforeseen site conditions or unforeseen conditions that, that can happen. And these two buckets need to be kept separate. There are options like shared, contingent, shared savings on the contingency that can be considered a best practice, typically in the contractor contingency. Contractors' contingency, 
Um, but the real key here is, and the real place where, where arguments seem to happen on these jobs is owners thinking that the contractor contingency, I'm gonna use the word belongs to them. So big shift in, in topic here. Um, Paul asked me to spend a little bit of time on the Inflation Reduction Act and the labor requirements um, and, and some thoughts on how you may be able to, to meet those requirements to maximize your, your percentage. So the first one is prevailing wage, which means David's bacon wages, which is a federal wage determination. For the most part in our current construction market, this is not an issue. The natural labor rates that, that contractors have to pay laborers to, to skilled labor are usually higher or comparable to Davis-Bacon. So it may add a little bit, but it's not a big deal. And everyone can access those, those rates and proceed under them. There are some places where that won't be the case, but in general, it's, it's not really a big challenge. The apprenticeship is a big challenge. So the, the requirements are that, the, that there be a percent a apprenticeship program with the contractors and that at least 12 and a half percent increasing up to 15 in 2024 and beyond of total, total labor hours must be performed by qualified apprenticeships. And that any company that employs more than four people must have at least one apprentice. So you, when you're doing your contracting, you need to make sure that your contractors have an apprenticeship program or are working with an apprenticeship program. Um, this is often, um, it, it may be easiest to deal with this with union contractors um, because they often have apprenticeship programs, but not always. Um, you may, you should probably be more proactive in this approach. Um, I've get, put a list, uh, a link on here to a partner finder with, with the federal government where, they're, where um, apprenticeship programs are up there. You can reach out to the local um, uh, contractors associations uh, to talk about apprenticeship programs. You want to reach out early so this doesn't become a surprise. And I skipped over it a moment ago, but I'm going to speak to it now. Um, there is a good faith exemption where you've made a good faith effort. You can't achieve it. The exemption exists. Please don't rely on it. It's not guaranteed. And um, the federal government has been fairly uh, direct in saying that, that they're going to be limited on that. And then finally, there's a presentation on the Department of Labor site that speak to these, these issues quite nicely. And then finally, I have to give my lawyers um, de uh, disclaimer down at the bottom. I'm not a lawyer. Talk to your own lawyers. Don't trust me. So that's all I had to say. Um, I'll stop sharing and uh, give it back to you. All right, Pete. Well done, thank you. So uh, a lot of information to process there. And Scott Martin gives his condolences to his Wi-Fi signal that uh, mm -hmm. it's terminated. So we're without Scott. So <laughs> um, it was nice knowing you, buddy, but uh, <laughs> the, the realities of doing virtual versus in person um, can be cold and hard at times. So I have a, a stack of notes here that I'd enjoy processing everything from specifications, open book versus closed book, you know, level of quality. I got I got so many uh, threads I could pull on here, but um, covered a lot of ground there, Pete, as as well did you, John. Um, I don't know, John, as you listen to Pete talk there, you must have been kind of uh, thinking of maybe a few provocative thoughts, any, anything you want to share, John, that's kind of on your mind of what, what you've been hearing since you, since you spoke, anything you want to layer back onto the conversation? Oh, you got us muted. There we go. Yeah. I mean, I, I generally agreed with, with 
uh, the bulk of what was said there. You know, when it comes to the hard bid EPC, where you lose control of of the final product, you know, I think. In terms of the clients we work with, uh, very few of them would would truly, I think, like to sign up for that exact scenario. Um, they're the ones who are, in large part, going to be operating these facilities. And you know, I'm thinking about like, you know, I'm going to come back to gas upgraders. Uh, something we always say, you know, there's plenty of scenarios where either a membrane or a PSA both could make perfect sense. And a common line we always say is, you know, ultimately it kind of comes down to what do you want to operate as the owner? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's one of those advantages of the of the progressive. Absolutely. I, I agree 100%. I would rather deliver a progressive for that exact reason. And, and, and let's put a pin in that topic, right? So rather than laying out options and offering rhetorical thoughts to the market, we can actually lead, right? So we're, we're established leaders in this space. So I'll go so far as to say, I'd encourage people to embark on a progressive design build journey. As would I. So we're in lockstep there, right? So it is a little scary in that, when you're interviewing EPC companies, this is not a 120 day relationship like you have with an engineer. They develop your, your set of plans and specs, and maybe they'll show up for some, for some CM later. This is a two year relationship you're entering into like, okay, swallow hard. Like you really want to enter this uh, commitment intentionally. And so you need the assurance that this partner has enough resources to support you. It's a very busy time. You don't want to be left at the altar, right? You want to be able to look them in the eye and say, you're with me here, right? You're, you're going to be with me the whole way. And so um, sometimes these EPC firms, they don't have all the disciplines in house. Maybe they have to outsource electrical. Maybe they outsource structural. That's all okay, right? Just because the progressive design build is... We're going to get from 2% design to 5% to 20 to 30 to 60 to 90 together. Mm -hmm. And me as the owner, I want to have input. And so this notion of maybe until you arrive at GMP, you're doing things on an open book basis where, yes, Mr. Customer, I've bid these pumps out. I've bid these screens out. You had a particular upgrade or you wanted. We have that in there. And yes, I make a profit as an EPC. I'm going to mark your components up X percent because that's my model of how I'm, I'm profitable. I'm offering you this single point of contact and I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to, as, as we said, Pete, I, I love the model, right? Take a wide magic marker, you draw a, a shape on the, on the GA drawing and say, I've got all of this, right? Yeah, I'm going to yeah. do it all. And so with that, is it can be frightening, but the EPC has earned their stripes saying, I'm good at this. This is my business. I'm going to do all of this. And so a proper set of contract documents that defines scope, a fear I have is like, how do you keep contracts from getting beyond 50 pages up to 500 pages? Because I'll ask you this question. What about specifications? How do we as an industry spell out the level of quality that we're going to deliver into projects. You want that one for me, I assume? Go ahead. Yeah, I should have kept my mouth shut. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a collaborative conversation. Um, you know, there are a hundred different ways to solve any problem. And, you know, you throw three engineers in a room and you get need to in a collaborative space you can discuss advantages and disadvantages of let's say stainless steel over steel pipe you know you can discuss um uh pneumatic versus electric valve controls um and when you're putting together your package your final package there does need to be some spec and that will often be an engineer specification that speaks to what you're going to install. It could be as simple as a table in a contract. All conduits shall be um, PVC coated rigid. 
all pipe shall be, you know, schedule 40 steel, uh, you know, cable, there must be four extra cables in each um, conduit and then two extra conduits, things like that. You can deal with it there, but in a, in a collaborative space, you, you work it out collaboratively. In a hard bid space, you have to work all that out during the bridging document. Um, and ultimately, what I'll say is I would rather have a 500 page contract that's very specific about what everything it wants than a 50 page contract that's rather vague. Because when it's vague, that's when arguments happen. My, my one struggle there is we're seeing people come into this space. Let's say if we're building ag projects, right? We're not gold plating things. This is not a nuclear power plant. So sometimes. Right we're saving money where we can. Right. And so if I'm an investor that came out of wind and solar a few days ago, how do I know that this contract spells out a product that is acceptable, that, that that's a that's a good, how do, I, how, how do I make sure it's a good project for fit for purpose? So, well, to a certain extent, your fit, fit for purpose warranty is comes into play, although there's arguments there too. And John, I'm gonna I'm gonna want you to chime in here as well. But you know, again, in in hard bid, that's what you work out with your owners with your advisor. You want advisors experienced enough in this to talk about, you know, where do you want to save money? How important is money versus longevity? Things like that. And it's easy to do in a progressive space. You want to pick up, John? Yeah, I mean, I guess what comes to mind for me is that we have kind of standards that that we generally prefer to follow. We're we're pretty flexible overall in our project delivery, but you know, if if an owner developer comes to us and doesn't have a handle on what specifications should be used on their own, then we have our default that we go to, and we'll show them. And generally, they're kind of in line with what you might see in municipal wastewater or industrial wastewater facilities. I can think of examples where a client might have standards or specifications that are beyond industry standard uh, for the biogas space. Uh, you know, some of the oil and gas companies come to mind as potentially having some specifications that are beyond what's industry standard. And, and we're actually, you know, entirely capable of implementing those. Uh, it's a matter of clearly explaining what the cost associated with that will be. Uh, again, that's why we like the collaborative conversation so that you know it gives us the opportunity to say, okay, you either didn't come in with uh, specifications in mind, here's what, what we see as industry standard, or you came in with maybe over the top specs, here's what the cost might be for that. I kind of on the other end of that spectrum is, you know, I think about some of the uh, dairies that uh, are project owners themselves and the design specifications that they might be used to building to in say a simple barn or something. Um, you know, they may look at our standards and say, well, why does it need to be to that level? Um, so again, that's the, the collaborative conversation where we say this is, you know, what we've seen in the industry. It's what we have done in the past that has worked and met, met needs. So uh, I guess those are kind of my general thoughts there. Yeah, yeah and I agree with them. Pete, interesting concept there of a split contingency. I never heard of that because when you have like a single bucket of contingency, yet the EPC actually controls that. If the right, owner right. says, can't we dedicate 10,000 to this fencing we didn't anticipate? You know, when the when the EPC controls the entire bucket of contingency, it's hard for the owner to get at it, right? Yep, exactly. Hard to impossible. And there's where fights start. That's why I always tell my owners, you need an owner's contingency. So definition of contingency, whatever we want to say, unforeseen circumstances, is that yep. is that the right way to describe it? Yeah, it's, you know, well, I, I had a estimator once who called it S-I-L-O, stuff I left out. But it's unforeseen things, unestimated items, things that you're not expecting at the beginning. No one can know everything day one. It's the amount of money you need, depending upon the design risks and the risks of the project. And it's very risk-driven. And you really do expect to spend it. Yet the joke is, 
that it's not a joke. Ultimately, what everybody aspires to is a project built with zero change orders. Correct. And so, John, when 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 does an EPC ask for a change order? What is the what is the contractual circumstances by which you ask for one? Uh, you know, I'm I'm not sure I'm going to be able to answer that one. I'll kick it to Pete. I'm curious what his answer is. <laughs> well, I, I mentioned it dur during the the presentation. the 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 definitional, typical definitional, um, acceptable change orders in an EPC contract are differing site conditions and owner changes. So, you know, examples. I we've all been here. You you dig a hole in an operating facility, and there's a pipe you didn't expect. That's a compensable change order. Um, if you knew the pipe was there, it's not. Um, similarly, I mean, the worst case scenario is you find an archaeological significantly significant site. Contractor can't possibly foresee that. That's a change order. But you know, um, I poured the concrete the 3000 pound concrete and it was 2,800 pounds on my brakes, no change orders there. You know, I didn't include enough money in the piping to, to get it from here to there. I forgot it. No, no change order there. It's, it's really, and then flip side owner comes in says, I want something different than what you're providing. That's a change order. And oh, by the way, at that point, you're no longer competitive. Yeah. And those change orders are uh, not cheap. So the reality is early on in the relationship stage, when you're selecting people, as you say, people you like, mm -hmm. those people are kind of gone after the project managers finish the final punch list. Yep. And then they're relegated to the contract. So relationships right. aside, it's going to be page 256 of the contract says X and Y and Z you are on the hook, you need to pay because that's what the contract yep. says. So it really is early on, it's about the relationship. Yep. A year down the line, it's about the contract. Yeah. In the end, you know, everybody wants to make their owners happy. We all do. John and I much prefer it when they smile when they see us at a conference. Um, but the contract is the contract and what's on the four sides of the paper is what's on there. Yeah. And that's that's the end of the story. John, a question for you. Um, so cost estimating, how do you go from a factored estimate to an estimate that has like, let's 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 just talk about this term material takeoffs and material and bulk materials. How how does that evolve? Sorry, could you say that again, Paul? <laughs> Was cutting up so my question was on when when to uh, factored estimates turn into kind of real estimates with material takeoffs like real feet of linear pipe and real um, yeah real so estimates, right? yeah I mean I guess we called that our preliminary design phase um, you know it's as we're narrowing down the contingency working towards that that guaranteed maximum price um, you know we do that kind of I guess all in in one phase we go from the concept design to the to that gmp um so you know as the design level dictates during the, that stage yeah yeah i'd yeah. say just adding on there typically around the 60 percent state design stage you've got enough detail to start doing material takeoffs and yeah. start building your costs more bottom up than top down at that point yeah I mean, it's easier with the equipment earlier, but, you know, feed a pipe, feed a conduit, number of valves, you can't do it until later. I think we're going to pick up some time in that uh, the questions have been more or less addressed and we're down, at, we're, we're man down here. So uh, <laughs> I think we're going to say this was a, a good one. And um, definitely getting a lot of interest in making sure that this is recorded. Yes, it's recorded. It's going to be on biogas.tv, the whole thing. And uh, the presentations are up on my website, green-tech.com forward slash events. 
So um, with that, I'm going to just say thanks, everybody, for coming. Again, September 7th, we have a next webinar on uh, specifically manufacturing in the U.S., so understanding U.S. codes and specs and standards and Americanizing European stuff. So watch out for that. I'm going to thank my friend, uh, friends here, Pete and John, for taking time from their week. We're grateful to uh, Noresco and Meat Hunt for uh, your, your time and your kindness and your participation. And uh, I think with that, we're going to call it, call it a good one. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. All right. Thanks, Paul. See you, Pete. Bye. See you, John. Bye. Bye, everybody.